short-term rental uh, um, permits has caused uh, um, kind of a, a last minute change to the, to the non-medical office use. Uh, again, striving to hit the, uh, um, to hit the, the mixed use uh, building and uh, again, looking to, to achieve the overall goal, which is to get uh, Dr. Zev uh, the ability to, to live and work, <clears throat> excuse me, in that, in the, uh, in the subdivision. Um, I guess I'll, I'll probably leave the summary for there and then, uh, and then wait uh, if to see if there's board comment or potentially uh, Maureen comments uh, from your end as far as staff review. None for me. Okay. Um, is anybody going to present the building? Do I, Maureen, do I have control over that? You do not. Do you want okay. control? Uh, I can I can move it or you can take over host responsibilities. I, no, I, I would probably mess, <laughs> mess that up seeing as I came in as Erica Coombs. <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so I can take you to the site plan if you want to start there. Uh, yes, please. So is this a good place for you to start? Sure, that's great, thank you. Um, so just for a little bit of orientation, you see Scott Dyer Road um, on uh, to, the, to the south of the lot and to the right of the screen, as well as, uh, as Hillway to the, uh, to the west of the lot and the bottom of the screen. Uh, and so this, this subject lot is lot three of that, um, of the, uh, the original subdivision. It is, um, uh, for, uh, proposed to be 14,002 square feet. Um, this, I guess, brings us to the amendment portion of the application. The original lot three uh, uh, lot size was uh, somewhat less, and it goes around 12,000 square feet. Um, and the the uh, uh, subdivision amendment proposed is essentially to uh, to slightly alter the lot line to give more room for for uh, the proposed building, uh, as well as the, the uh, appropriate setbacks, the building setback and parking setback. And so uh, you can see Maureen looks like is um, kind of running the cursor along the, the lot three property line on the site plan, uh, as if she's reading my mind. <laughs> uh, um, and so you can see uh, uh, to, the, to the top of the screen, there's parking proposed. Um, currently, five parking uh, parking spaces proposed outside of the garage, and then two um, spaces proposed inside the garage. Um, and then, as you move down, uh, uh, yep, and, and uh, Maureen's kind of circling the cursor around around the garage area, um, and uh, and and then the the rest of the residents, um, uh, sort of down below. Uh, below, lower on the screen uh, is the, uh, uh, the rest of the residents. There's uh, um, access points from the, from the front of the building, from Scott Dyer Road. Um, uh, and I, I don't know if it's appropriate here to speak to some of the, the actual nitty gritty standards, but... Um, Rick, I apologize to interrupt. Can you just tell us what map number you're looking at? Uh, that should be C two point one. Yeah. And it should be plan thirteen. Oh, it's on the screen here. Thirteen of twenty two in your package. 
we got some very nicely folded smaller maps. So I just wanted to look at the right one. So thank you. Yeah, my apologies on, on the folded large size maps. Um, I, I now understand that that's probably not a preferable way for you guys to receive the plans. For what it's worth, I actually like it. It works okay. Yeah, so you like the I, I, I didn't mind it. We're happy to happy to provide future submissions in the, uh, either folded or or in the bound uh, format. Um, kind of going around the site plan, there are a couple of stormwater uh, elements proposed. One is uh, along the hillway frontage, and another along the Scott Dyer frontage. Um, and for those of you familiar with that that area, the, um, uh, the rain garden is is uh, adjacent to the Red Barn property. Again, access access from Scott Dyer Road uh, into the front of the building, the the. The uh, facade and the and the front address is is really to the Scott Dyer Road, um, uh, being the the main entrance. And uh, um, it doesn't show up well on on the site plan, but you've got a a front porch and a rear porch, and uh, and then uh, landscape elements as well. And uh, and there's a, a landscaping plan that accompanies that that kind of highlights these elements. And so, um, I mean, I, where it's, this is my first time in front of, uh, in front of you folks. Uh, you folks, you folks, you folks, you folks, you folks. Ooh, got hot mic. Uh, uh, as a board, and uh, I want to make sure that I'm respectful of your time. So I could, I could describe the site all day long, um, but I want to make sure that I'm, I'm kind of hitting the right notes for you and, and not going over time. Uh, and so I guess I'd, I'd be looking to either you, Maureen, or, or, or the board for a little bit of direction on uh, what other elements um, you might want for, a, for an overview of, of this project. Uh, though I will say that we've, as part of the drawing package, we've provided some renderings, which, uh, as we all know, a uh, picture uh, is worth a thousand words. And so there are some, some uh, uh, photorealistic renderings that help to, to give a, a feel for the, what's being proposed. Can you, oh, so I think one thing, can you just talk briefly about the grading? Uh, it looks like your um, entry off of Scott Dyer goes down a bunch of steps and hits a patio under the porch. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. Uh, the, uh, as part of meeting the 50% the uh, above grade standard for the, the first floor uh, or um, uh, non-residential space, uh, uh, the, uh, the grading is, uh, the, the building is situated on the, on the site so that it's um, raised up slightly from the, uh, uh, from the second floor uh, perspective being uh, the, the garage entry and uh, the, the first residential floor living space. Um, and so that's, that's up within the site, that's raised up within the site slightly. Um, and, then, uh, and then the grading for access to the, to the lowest floor, to the non-residential piece is set down into the site a little bit. And, uh, and so that grading is kind of splitting the difference between, the, between the, 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 that one story. Uh, and yes, so there are there are uh, site steps that go down um, into the access for uh, for the the first floor, and there's a, a, a proposed patio below the, the porch as well as retaining walls, which show up on the grading plan as as um, a retaining wall by others, um, and uh, and kind of bolder black lines. All right, wait. Can you hold on one second, Maureen? Go back to that. Go back. I have a question yeah. too, Joe, when you get down. Okay. So I want everybody to freeze this in their mind. And then Maureen, can you go to the front elevation?
I just want to make sure everybody's building up a clear picture here in their mind. So you see where those are the doors and that's the patio, this, this patio below the screen porch. So can you run the cursor approximately where the stairs are in front? Everybody see that? Can you see the retaining wall there? That corresponds to the big black line on the plan that you were just looking at. Joe, could you describe the use of each level of the uh, shoulder and the elevation? I have a, I have a question, Joe. Uh, go ahead, Carol Ann. <laughs> and mine, mine it directly has something to do with what we're talking about. Uh, if this is a non-residential space, which should, could potentially be used as an office space, what about handicap accessibility with the stairs that are part of the access from Scott Dyer Road? Yeah, that's, they've got to cr crack that nut. And, and I, I interrupted you, Peter, because it seemed to fit with what we were just talking about. But you're right, as it stands now, it's not, there's no accessible route to the primary commercial level. Uh, uh, okay, you, Maureen and uh, Peter and then Maureen. Just for, uh, for clarity's sake, Joe, could you or the applicant describe the intended use for each of what appear to be three levels of occupancy in this, in this elevation? Okay, Rick, that's you. you can do yep. That. Uh, so the, the levels two and three are, are intended for single family residential use. Uh, level one is the non-medical office space. The village retail, some commercial use, is that the idea? Um, ultimately, the goal is, is to um, allow Dr. Zev uh, you know, a, a place to conduct business of the, the two, uh, two penguin properties. And uh, again, it's, you know, it's really uh, aiming to fulfill the, the mixed use um, uh, requirement of the building in order to fit within uh, the lot given the zoning. But basically you're saying that the upper two levels are single family residents and the basement or the, you know, the sub ground level is going to be some type of a commercial use consistent with his adjoining uh, medical practice. I uh, potentially consistent with the with the medical office, um, and then potentially for the you know for the uh, two penguin properties real estate. So as far as zoning goes, it doesn't really matter if it's medical or non medical. It's just office. Is that correct, Maureen? Yeah, I, b I believe the applicant is trying to go for non-medical office because medical office has a higher parking requirement. Oh, okay. So Maureen, you w w wanted to say something before Peter? No, nope, you're all set. You got there. Well, Joe, can I just ask one more dimension of the question, I guess? If without that basement level uh, commercial use of some type, this would be then a simply a single family residence, which has a totally different requirement in the um, village center district, which this would not comply with, right? So this, this basement level usage for commercial purposes is actually crucial for to what he's trying to do. Is that correct, Marie? Yes, that's correct. This, I mean, and I, I respectfully, and I have I take no pleasure in criticizing the applicant's proposal. I, I feel like I need to say that, but it, it just appears that the applicant is intending to build a very attractive single family home. And in the town center district, a single family home minimum lot size is an 80,000 square foot lot. And this lot is much smaller than that. And so they're trying to take what has been designed as a single family home and somehow convert into a mixed use by using the basement for a non-residential use. So Maureen, since we're on the subject of basement, in the packet 
there was a little diagram that showed percentage of area above grade and percentage of area below grade. And in um, Ben McDougall's email, he actually requested the average finished grade at the perimeter of the building, not the average. And that's a very different calculation. So I don't know if you caught that, Rick, but that's definitely something you're going to need for the next round of this. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, we've run that that calculation uh, for the for the first floor, the the perimeter um, of the first floor space. Uh, it's the perimeter of the whole building. It's the average grade of the elevation around the entire building. You can clarify that with the code officer, but. I mean, it is his, it's the, your definition and calculations can have to be acceptable to him. I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, running, running the calc on the, on the perimeter of the entire building, it's, uh, it's very close. Um, and actually, I think it's at 49%. So uh, as, a, as a future submission, if we get to, to that point and resolve uh, some, some potential other um, uh, uh, sticky wickets, um, we'll make sure to, to adjust the retaining wall accordingly so that we can hit the 50% mark. Okay. Uh, Jim. He's, Jim is muted. Jim, your your mic is off. I'm on it. I'm, um, sorry. Um, so, say we put this through as as it is. I'm just conjecturing. Who's going to monitor whether that first floor ever becomes actual office space instead of just the living space? And then, like you said, you essentially got a a single family home. Is that a question to me? Well, I, I guess I'm just thinking out loud because maybe he's trying to meet the letter of the law, but maybe not the spirit of it. I'm not sure that's the right way to say it either, because like you said, it just appears like it's a single family home for all practical purposes, because that first floor has got a, a kitchen and it doesn't say bedroom, but could easily be bedroom. Um, I, 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 I guess I'm not sure how to ask the question. It, it um, would would anybody even monitor to see if he rents it out maureen well it this is a challenge i've had a couple of conversations with the code enforcement officer and frankly we're both concerned uh, i would say the the first thing that needs to happen is that the design of the building has to read mixed use it have you have to really try to as much as possible have this building function be designed like it's supposed to meet the zoning. Um, a good example is, is when you're designing a road. Um, if you design a road for people to drive 45 miles an hour and then you put up a 25 mile per hour zone sign, um, you're gonna have a lot of speed enforcement issues. If you design the road to make people drive 25 miles an hour, half of your problem is solved. So that's, that's the first piece. And, this, and, and I think the code officer I had asked the question, anticipated it was gonna be an issue. And he has made some suggestions about the first floor being redesigned. So it really looks a lot more like a classic office space and not like the floor plan of a short term rental. Uh, so that's the first big piece. And then the second big piece is, yeah, the code officer is going to have to do some enforcement. And, and that is a big question mark, how, how that's going to happen. Joe, can I? Pipe yes. up. Well, uh, sir, building on that, I would <laughs> remind the board that not too long ago, what was it two? I can't remember the, the number, but Shore Road, where we 26. forced them to remove an entire kitchen because it looked too much like a kitchen and basically a living space. But this is essentially the exact same issue being created from scratch. So it would seem totally counter to us, you know, that our work to try and move that whole situation in the opposite direction to then allow that. Um, 
I could certainly see it if it was if it was a short term rental, that would make sense because it's essentially just a, a residence that's rented out. But uh, in this configuration, it makes no sense. Um, all right. Uh, go ahead, Carol Ann. I'm I'm curious. I mean, I read through uh, the uh, memorandum and the uh, engineers' comments, and there there were a lot of them. And I'm wondering how much progress uh, they're making at looking at and addressing each of the comments that were that have already been put forth by the engineer and by um, staff in the memorandum. I, I appreciate you bringing that up because uh, we have been been working away at, at uh, sorry about that little tech difficulties uh, working away at the the um, the comments from from the town engineer um, there are, are frankly um, some of the comments are um, engineer to engineer uh, fairly easy to to uh, to correct and rectify and uh, and make solutions to um, and uh, and and the response to uh, the town engineer would would reflect that, uh, as well as the uh, revision of of the plan plan set. And there are also some comments there that are that are um, problematic for for um, uh, being able to meet without without waiver. Um, and I, I think it was brought up originally the the. Uh, um, Handicap accessibility, ADA access to the to the bottom floor, uh, I think kind of runs counter. Um, you know, the uh, we can do site ramps, we can we can uh, design site ramps for ADA accessibility, um, uh, but it does uh, sort of run counter to the to the goals of the of the property, uh, as well as the uh, the at the parking. Um, uh, a handicapped parking stall with with van accessibility and then route to that ramp um, you know another challenge for that lot where it's where it's fairly small and uh, uh, the uh, the two-way public access at standard width um, is you know is frankly nearly the same width as the as the parking area um, uh, at the rear of the rear of the, the garage or adjacent to the garage um, and uh, and so I think the applicant would be looking to the board for uh, some guidance on on uh, how waiverable um, either of these standards might be. Well, ADA standards are beyond the board. I mean, those are. Am I correct in that, though? The ADA standards. Yeah, I mean. You... <laughs> You know, if, if the town engineer looks at this and says you need a wider driveway, we're not going to argue with them. I'm not, because I mean, and typically we don't. Um, I just I think you got a lot of work to do on this, so probably be better not to uh, start looking at too many items. That you're gonna, you know, you may find working through it that that's not as big a problem as you think. Um, one thing I see, and I hesitate to make this comment because I'm doing it as an architect and not as a member of the planning board, but this looks to me like a building designed by a residential designer, and it's a commercial project. You know, that first floor is a business occupancy, and so you're under IBC, not IRC. So, I mean, like, things like the stair going from the first floor living room down into the lower level, that doesn't really happen like that in commercial construction. You know, and yeah, fire separations, yeah, it's there's, there's a whole other set of codes, and I think you, you really need to have like an architect who does commercial construction take a look at this. Joe? Yes. I just want to confirm that what you just said is generally the same comments that the code officer has made to me. Well, good. 
Uh, uh, Joe, one question. Peter. Um, and I hate to beat this mixed use thing to death, but could you bring up the floor plan for that basement? Uh, I'm, I'm concerned as well, I guess, as we're looking at a single family house with a basement that we're saying, yeah, you know, maybe it'll be rented, maybe it won't. Um, but it seems to me that it ought to be fairly obvious something that is inconsistent with any use other than commercial rental. And if, if you're talking about it being adaptable to a residential short-term rental, that to me is, is totally contrary to what, we, what we're looking for. Uh, so we have a kitchen, a dining area, workspace, what we're calling work rooms, which could be bedrooms, I suppose, right? And we have a full bath. It does look an awful lot like an apartment. Uh, if you just change the labeling slightly. But what am I missing here? Not a thing. My thoughts exactly, Peter. Yeah, I think you're 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 noting um it you know the 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 challenge for this application, which is um you know the, the goal is single family residential um with the ability uh for the for the office space to to function, um, you know, Dr. Zev would, would tell you that the, um, you know, the, the kitchen is necessary for folks who are traveling from, from out of state and, uh, uh, and potentially bunking up, you know, um, for, uh, for work purpose and using the, the, the workspace. Um, but I, I think you've highlighted that, um, you know, the, the primary objective is, uh, is giving them a, a, a giving the the Meyerowitzes uh, a space that they can can work from um, as well as as well as live in um, that meets the the uh, the definition of of the uh, the zoning. All right, folks. Yep. One other thing, we are. I mean, I get. If this were a normal meeting, we'd be discussing this for completeness. Um, and it seems like a lot of these comments are beyond the question of completeness. Is everybody okay with that at this point? Is there anybody who thinks we should just stick with more broad issues of completeness? I certainly think we have all the information in front of us that allows us to talk about this. In. Okay. Which I, I guess want to double right. check on that. Oh, can I can I just say one thing on that? Yes. Um, and this was sort of the same comment I made for the neighboring pro property um, that I know that I was in the minority when it came to the vote on completeness, but that project that came before us, I thought, was very far away from being something that would be presentable under the town center zoning ordinance and yes i agree with carol ann that, that I, I mean this is far and away um has much more information i think they, they put in a lot more effort which is i like seeing this type of complete package and we're not to guess what they're trying to do um but uh, so i i just when we say completeness um that's sort of what i kind of struggle with on whether or not something is complete if it's not to the point where it would measure up to the standards that whatever zoning, um, uh, uh, whatever, uh, or well, the ordinance is under the zoning um, section of the town that they're in, so town center. Um, one thing that I was just going to point out is something that we noted on the last project as well was the pedestrian friendly um, front entryway. And I know that there definitely is a front entryway for this ground floor with regards to office space, but it is kind of tucked back underneath an overhang um, that I think, I don't know, would be that sort of front entryway that you would expect for a commercial building in the town center. So I just want to throw that out there. I don't think that given the fact that the notice issue for this whole meeting, whether or not we should be talking too much or going too far down that path without, um, that information being out there for the public, but uh, those are just my comments right now. Jim? Yeah, um, 
I, of course, I didn't see it on the on the site plan. You know, the discussion of street lights. Are we? Is there are there any included? Just to make sure that's you know it's town center. I didn't see any, but is that a question for me? Yeah. Uh, well, we've been pushing the street light issue predominantly on Ocean House Road. I will say that um, I don't know if you want to talk about street lights on this project. The when the town rebuilt Shore uh, rebuilt Scott Dyer Road, and by the way, the paving that finishes that entire project is supposed to happen next month. But when the town rebuilt uh, Scott Dyer Road, um, this property did not have front, did not have sidewalk on its shore, its Scott Dyer Road frontage, and the town built that sidewalk. So the town chose not to put lighting in on that side of the road. There's only lighting on the other side of Scott Dyer Road. I just give you that context. Um, the lighting discussion really had been focusing on Ocean House Road. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, if you look at drawing C 2.4, the landscaping plan. So one of the <clears throat> Steve Harding, I think it was Steve Harding's comments is that the landscaping has <clears throat> been all placed outside the property line and would need to be moved in. If it's moved in, it's going to be on the slope. Is that, I mean, is, can you plant that slope at this level? And yeah. Yeah, so that's that'll be a comment that that we're potentially uh, looking into, um, as as was the case with uh, with the the ten to twelve hillway submission, um, the uh, uh, some of the the landscape uh, uh, design is is coming from uh, a relation of of Dr. Zev, and uh, and so we're presenting that and uh, you know as as part of the mainland plan set, but I'd want to probably correspond with uh, with him on how how the applicant would like to have that landscaping and and then as far as the slope goes um, you know what that uh, presents for challenges for that type of, of vegetation so that that looks like about five or six feet between the sidewalk and the property line is that about right maybe a little more or less but so Maureen, that area would just normally be grass, right? Yes. And, and it, again, you know, it's not that the town is against landscaping in the right of way. Uh, we love street trees, but um, again, I, I, I hate to say it, but this really feels like the applicant is trying to create a continuous landscaping buffer around their single family home and putting it in the right of way. Okay. Would, would uh, less landscaping be uh, something that'd be a preference for, for the board? There's a whole, <clears throat> there's a section on the town center standards that talks about what, how to do landscaping between the sidewalk and the building. Um, you may want to take a look at that or whoever's doing the landscaping there. Question, Joe. Pardon me? I'd like to ask Oh, sorry. This is Go kind ahead, of a Caroline. boring question. It has to do with landscaping. 
um, does the tree warden need to review the uh, choices or are these all from the approved list? Um, typically, we don't pull the tree warden in unless we have concerns about the trees. Um, okay. Usually that's done mostly by me, but I can certainly ask the tree warden to look at it. No. Uh, if they're all on the approved list, I don't have a problem. I, my guess would be you've already checked it out. <laughs> what I haven't checked, I will check. How's that? Oh, okay. <laughs> I think we yeah. have, to be fair, we have a legend here. And I do remember looking yeah, at it. Yeah, I was reading, the one that caught my eye was the maple. Yes, I do remember that was a little, I mean, that's something we could ask the applicant to definitely And not. I don't remember where the maples fell, if they all fell off or if it was just certain ones. Yeah, we, we're not putting in maples. So those would have been all the Ds. And like, so this, this is the maple one. right here. And so it doesn't look like it would be too many to replace. I think the others are acceptable, but that was that one caught my eye and I wasn't sure if I remembered everything on the list. So. Yeah, we, we our, our staff needs to look at that again. That's a good call, thank you. Yeah. If it would save the, the, uh, the comment and revision time, is that uh, list available, Maureen? Yes, it is. It is in the subdivision ordinance. I believe it's Appendix D or B. It's one of the appendices in the subdivision ordinance. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll cross check that too. Great. Thank you. Well, Peter. Yeah, Joe, this, I don't know if this is a technical way of looking at this question about usage, but Maureen, am I correct in remembering that the basic um, use criteria in the town center is that the quote, first floor shall be commercial, and that the above the first floor, second and third, uh, can be residential. So do we have a real question as to whether this space, which arguably may or may not be have commercial use, is really the first floor? Or is this a sub-grade uh, uh, level, and so the, the project simply wouldn't qualify for the criteria? So Peter, that, that's, that's a very good point. Um, and, you know, unfortunately the applicant and staff had gone back and forth a couple of times on this. Um, the first time the applicant tried to come to the planning board workshop, they got pulled off the workshop because the entire first, what we're calling the first floor was below grade yeah. and um, therefore could not be considered a first floor, the code officer has been using the building code definition, at least half of it has to be above grade. And so that's when he came to the second workshop and you saw these two enormous, excuse me, but two enormous um, retaining walls, which are basically holding the earth back of half of the floor area of the basement so it can qualify as a first floor. So in, in, in the your and the code enforcement officer's opinion, that lower level does actually meet the definition of the first floor. That the, hasn't been shown yet. Yeah, the code officer has asked for addition, an additional calculation. And so I am deferring to him on that. It's a little tricky and again, in that the what we call the second floor is actually much larger than 1,920 square feet because a bunch of, uh, well, a de decent amount of the area underneath the second floor is unexcavated. So all of the garage area is unexcavated. And uh, but I'm, that's why you do the perimeter. Of exactly. The, exactly. You don't do the area. Right. But to me, this is a, this is a threshold issue. And if, if you can't satisfy that test, you know, you're dead in the water. So uh, this even takes us to the point of completeness. Uh, without that calculation, without that determination, I don't think we have a complete application. I think you're right. And Peter, that was why it, uh, it's very, very, very rare that we hold someone back for a workshop. And that's why the, that it got hold back from the workshop because it was a uh, fundamental, blatant failure to comply with the current zoning. 
Now it's more subtle. <laughs> Hey, Joe. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Mark, Mark, I think I remember seeing in your emails, you had a question to Ben about whether a short term rental was considered a business or commercial use. Did I remember seeing that? Uh, no, we, we went through that earlier um, during the workshop phase and the short term rental for right now is very much listed as a non residential use. But uh, the, you know, the, unfortunately, there's a bunch of wrinkles with this, which definitely makes it harder for the applicant. And I regret that it makes it harder, but it is what it is. So as the board knows, the town is revising its short-term rental regulations. And the planning board is in the thick of reviews, reviewing those drafts. Um, in June of this year, the council adopted a moratorium on any new short-term rental permits. So... I needed to know if the applicant was proposing a short-term rental, whether the planning board could proceed with review. And what the town attorney uh, determined, and I think I sent that letter to you, is in fact, the planning board can approve a short-term rental as a non-residential use on this building's first floor. But then the applicant would have problems getting a certificate of occupancy under the building permit scenario. And I don't know if that was why uh, they pivoted from the short-term rental on the first floor to a non-medical office on the first floor. But, um, you know, we don't know what those short-term rental ordinance amendments are going to look like till after they're adopted. So who knows where, where short-term rentals are going to be allowed when, when the town is done with this most recent review. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, it's a subject for a different time, but I don't, uh, I know there's a moratorium. I don't have a problem with short-term rentals in the town center district, um, but I guess we have to wait for the mor moratorium to be listed. But I guess as it is right now, I have a hard time supporting this because it's essentially a house. And um, I guess I'm struggling with this. I don't know how else to say, and I'm, I'm trying to trouble putting my thoughts into words, but I have trouble supporting this if it's, if it's the, remains the way it is. Um, Maureen, uh, yep. we didn't do a public comment, did we? Yet? You, you did not. And, um, is, can, I think you should. All right. Is there anyone listening who wishes to make a comment in a public comment session? Well, the applicant is there and has his hand raised. Okay. Zev, can you hear us? Oh, thank goodness. I've been trying to com I've been trying to comment on this for the last 25 minutes. So I'm glad someone's finally allowed me to have the privilege of speaking. I do appreciate that. So it, it's important. Um, that there's been a lot I've been I'd like to contribute to on this, and and it's it's been very frustrating. I I I honestly neither didn't receive an invite to this go to meeting from Maureen, nor did I uh, be allowed to speak during this entire process. So I I do understand that this is a, a nuanced process and this is a digital meeting. Um, but nonetheless, I think this is an area for improvement uh, because if, if the applicant's not allowed to speak during the process, I think your I think this method is, is somewhat flawed. Um, this is supposed to be a little bit of a dialogue. Um, okay, so I think the, this planning board's familiar with the fact that uh, we've been trying to move forward with a short-term rental, which met the letter of the use for, for, the, for the building. And we've received a lot of uh, blockage, as Maureen has alluded, uh, alluded or, and, and a lack of guidance on how to allow this building to move forward. Um, prior to being allowed to be submitted, uh, it, it's important to understand that we, we went, underwent all the expenses of going through site plan development and subdivision um, uh, modification. And then the, the, the laws changed. We had a, a building that by definition met. We, we didn't have to meet the ADA compliance with the short-term rentals. Um, and then the rules changed at the 11th hour. And so we were, we were denied uh, planning board uh, the previous month because there was a erroneous conjecture about a right-of-way concern um, with the adjacent to Butter or with, with Hillway being a state road. Um, our original deeds in our 2017 
submission showed that we only had a 50 foot right of way on our side, but nonetheless, we are erroneously denied. And that might have made this submission as a short term rental precede the moratorium or the uh, proposed amendments on short term rentals in, in the town center zone. Um, so I understand that there's a lot of conjecture and there's a lot of concerns. We're trying to move forward to make this building work. Um, but, you know, it, this has been an extremely frustrating process. Uh, I mean, extremely frustrating process because we're this. I understand the zoning for the lot and we're trying to meet the letter of it. But if you look at the building qualitatively, on one side, it's abutted by a two unit farmhouse. On another side, it's abutted by a single family home. On another side, it's abutted by a uh, non buildable 6,000 square foot lot with a red barn. And then on the other side, it's abutted by the middle school. And so I understand that we're, we're trying to meet the letter of the law, but qual qualitatively, this building is a transition. It's, this is a transitional lot. It wouldn't make any sense for me to put a Golden Corral or Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts on this lot. I, I believe the pushback from the town for putting a, a true commercial use would be outrageous. I don't think it would fit the character of the Cape Elizabeth Town Center. And I don't think that it would be what this planning board wants. And so we're, we could easily look at a home in an adjacent neighborhood, but we strongly feel that a transitional building that would have a, a non-residential use on the, ground, on the ground floor, and I, I really do wish we would call it a ground floor and not a basement. We did put in the retaining walls exactly in excess of 50%, which was the guiding um, instructions from the town manager to meet the definition of what would make this a ground floor and not a basement. Um, we designed this building, again, just like we did our uh, 810 Hillway development to meet the exact letter of what was expected by the town. Um, I, there's been some comments on the front atrium, and, and I, I find that frustrating because our front atrium in our medical office space is in it, within a central atrium that's recessed between the two buildings. Um, the 810 Hillway building is very similar in the grading with the drop down that we have established. Now, it, it, it's not as noticeable because the lot does have a little bit of, of, a, of a grade, but from a percentage point on a, uh, on a slope, it's somewhat similar to this lot. It's, it's right in line. We've done the calculations on that. So this lot is graded in a way that's very similar with the 810 and the 12 lots to follow the slope of the hill. And so I, I do understand a lot of the concerns that, that we've heard, but I, I want everyone to understand the chronological issues that have, that, that have put us in this position because we've attempted to move forward quickly. Um, we've attempted to submit this at a time when a short term rental was allowed. Um, we were, we, we experienced a significant amount of uh, difficulty uh, and lack of amicable working relationships and trying to get submitted. And now we find ourselves at the 11th hour unable to submit because the laws are, there's an amendment proposed. And so I, I know that this, this is a community. I know each and every one of you. I know that all of you know me as a person. I understand that you're volunteers and having to play a role on this, on this board. But I, I am also, you know, I've been on various, various calls for different businesses and this is the exact reason why we don't have lots that are, that are being built, uh, you know. And so I'm gonna wrap that up, but I, I, if there's any more uh, history of chronological, chronological order I'd like to illustrate, I'm happy to do so. Okay, Maureen, is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Nobody else is raising their hand. Okay. Andrew. Um, I just want a point of a clarification here. I think um, as I read it from the town attorney that it's not, am, am I correct to say that, he's, that he didn't say that he couldn't propose it as a short term rental it's just he does it at his own risk. Is that correct? And that he could keep it if he, he if he went forward with this, he could say it's going to be a short term rental. We're keeping it as it is. I'm going to take the risk of that. Um, is that true? Yes, I, I do. Thank you for asking. I, I want to clarify that uh, the town adopted a moratorium on new short term rental permits as of June 1st. And since the building doesn't exist yet, you wouldn't be able to get a short-term rental permit for it prior to June 1st. So it's the moratorium that held you up. 
but the moratorium applies to issuance of permits for building code. And the town attorney actually took the opinion that the applicant could proceed ahead with a short-term rental permit for the first floor, but you know there is a risk that by the time the town completes its amendment process, um, the short-term rental on the first floor in the town center may not be something that's allowed. Uh, that's that's the risk, and uh, I understand the applicants frustrated, uh, but I think that at least on the short-term rental, I don't think there was any delay. Um, from what the applicant could have been able to do. The short-term rental process and amendments been going on since October of 2019. The uh, moratorium was adopted, I believe, in April to take effect June 1st. But Maureen, for clarity's sake, the town uh, attorney is saying that the use of that basement, or the, what, what, I'm sorry, the first floor uh, uh, premises, if it was used for a short-term residential use, would qualify as for the mixed-use definition. It right now it does, it but does. there is a moratorium in place. The expectation is that the moratorium will stay in place until new short-term rental regulations are adopted, and who knows if it will still be considered a non-residential use after those amendments are adopted. So just the technical statement in the ordinance that a short-term rental is, a, is, a, is an ancillary use to re residential, which may be the outcome if we require the owner-occupied you know, owner -occupied buildings. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, it, this is a really technical point, but it, it, it's not a, uh, it, you know, it's not a Starbucks, it's not an apparel store, it's not an art gallery, uh, all that we understand. But if it's dedicated to renting out to short-term rentals, and you're saying that if, if the new ordinance permits that, then he's good to go, as far as you're concerned. If he could operate a short-term rental. As right now, there is a list of non-residential uses in the town center zone. And you can pick from that list any of those uses to meet this non-residential use requirement. And short-term rental is on that list. If that short-term rental gets moved off that list and into another section, then there could be a problem. And the trend, I mean, anyone looking at the short-term rental discussion and the short-term rental amendments, the trend is to really starting to focus on owner-occupied, on preserving housing stock. So I just don't think anyone should assume that that is not gonna change. And I don't know what I don't know what's gonna be adopted. Honestly, I don't think anybody knows yet. It's been an exhaustive process. It's an iterative process. We won't know until four members of the council raise their hand. All right, anybody else? So just going back to this, if we were to look at this again from our original submission before we were uh, uh, coerced or, or encouraged to consider going with a uh, more commercial use, the short-term rental does negate some of our ADA challenges. It gets rid of our parking concerns because the, the, the parking units required are reduced from a non-medical professional use is there if we were to move forward from the perspective of this being a short-term rental on the ground floor can we just take a moment and and note any concerns for a submission so in the event if i choose to do that again in a month we don't have to do this all over again because i have no concerns with that being a short-term rental It, it does mitigate a lot of the concern. I would caution the board that it doesn't take care of everything. But it's, it's, it's a big risk. Maureen, could you be more specific? I really can't, Zeb. 
I mean, I really think this is a conversation that you have to have with the code enforcement officer. And I understand that you don't feel that town staff's been very helpful, but uh, we feel like we've been trying to work with you. Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I think the code enforcement officer has been, been great. Yep. You're welcome. Hmm. Well, just for, for clarity, I mean, Jeff, I, I make this point mainly because of what I think the ordinance says or means, and I'm not, but we're still trying to work that one out. And I see nothing inherently wrong with what you're trying to do. And it looks like a very attractive building and a good use for the, the lot and everything else. But at some point, wouldn't it make sense to sort of call that quote first floor area what it really is? I mean, you you know, you you're you're talking about workspace and and it's I don't know. I, um, Mr. Curry, um, so again, this building, I'm trying to make it meet a need. I have, I have three different LLCs and 20 different employees. If I had to have an employee work at that level to establish the use to make the building suffice, I can do that. Um, I would even be able to uh, probably co move around the ADA requirements because I have ADA requirements in my adjacent building. And if I had an employee that had those issues, I could accommodate those needs. And so, you know, and, and it's quite reasonable for me to even have a, a place that could be established as a domicile, because again, you know, I wouldn't consider a call room for a medical doctor in the hospital, a residential use. You know, if I have, if I have a need for somebody to be there for extended hours and there's a recovery space, I, I, I would still, you know, mention that that would be considered a, a commercial use. And so again, you know, I'm not, I'm trying at, at an effort of trying to be transparent. I'm not trying to be disingenuous with the board. You know, my primary goal is to have my single family home here, but to also create a building that meets the need or the letter of the zoning for the town. And mm -hmm. the short-term rental proposal um, did that succinctly. Um, the definitions of it being specified as a non-residential use specifically, as opposed to an accessory use were, were succinct. And it was a nice, you know, opportunity for, for me to build a transition building, you know, that, that built into the, the character of, of Cape Elizabeth. Yeah. And as was previously mentioned, that's why we use a residential architect. It was easy to modify this because even though it was, uh, it was considered a, it was a, a short-term rental is a, is a, re, is a, a use that's meant to have a, a comfort or a, a home type feeling, but it was still defined as a commercial use. In our adjacent building, I think that Everyone would agree that we use scaling techniques, we use residential notes and, and, and aesthetics to attempt to make the building fit into the character of Cape Elizabeth. And I, and I think looking at the finished product three years later, I think we achieved that really well. I thought we made it a very tasteful building. Um, I'm trying to do that again. And I'm trying to do that in a way that, that meets the need that works for everybody. I don't wanna put a gas station here. I don't wanna put a Starbucks here. I don't wanna put a, a chain here but I can, as long as I meet all the needs. But and the the day, and, and rent, I think this is the best approach. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if you're gonna rent that out for you know, repetitive uh, you know, short-term rentals, you need a residential certificate of occupancy, do you not? And, and so it's gonna to have to be designed with that particular set of criteria in mind, I think. Maureen, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Don't you need a CO for uh, if that's going to be you know used for nothing but residential uh, usage? Well, Peter, I mean the challenge is that we. I mean, I am not trying to irritate anyone here, but we're saying one thing and then we're saying another thing in order to meet the ordinance. And uh, there is some division. The code officer was willing, if this was short-term rental, to call it a residential use. The fire chief said, look, if this is a non-residential use, it should meet the non-residential fire code, which means it needs a sprinkler system. Because if you get approved as a short-term rental, as a non-residential use, you can transition this to another business use. And, and you know, we, we are supposed to remember that the person that's building the building may not always be the person that's owning the building and different business uses can go into this first floor. So mm -hmm. it needs to be built to meet certain commercial codes and the 
code officer and the fire chief are going to have to work out how they're going to make that work. Um, and I, that's why I'm saying there, there should be a conversation directly with the code officer because I should not be administering building codes. I'm the one that's working with site plan review. Rick, didn't we make a modification to the plan to include a sprinkler? Yes, yeah. yes there is sprinkler, yeah. in this. is sprinkler in the plan. Yeah, if that's if that's you know 100% necessary for what for what checks the box for the uh, for the fire chief, then uh, then so be it. Um, we did also suggest that the board might conditionally approve. Uh, that any any change in use from the short term rental would come back in front of the board uh, uh, for uh, for their review for your review. Uh, oh, sorry, Maureen. So so this is the challenge. I mean, the board has ordinances, and the applicant says he wants to meet the ordinances, and then the first thing that happens is, but I, this isn't really what the town wants, or I need a waiver from parking. Um, so this is this is the challenge we're having. Um, and you know, if if this building is built, it's supposed to be a mixed use building. The first floor is supposed to be a commercial type use. And currently, according to that standard, a short-term rental qualifies, correct? Yes. Rick, are you raising your hand? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to note that I think um, the, the code enforcement officer had acknowledged that uh, while it was a commercial use, I think his, his um, view of the um, of the nature of the use was that it was uh, residential in nature. Um, that was that was where the the um, uh, as far as as far as the CEO's view of the sprinkling. Um, that's where that that finding was coming from. That it didn't need sprinkling because it, it was still of a residential nature. Even though um, the the short term rental checks the box on the commercial use. I mean, I, I should point out that we don't really get, we try not to be too involved in what the code officer is or won't require. I mean, that's his purview. And we just say, whatever the code officer wants is what needs to be there. All right. Does anybody have anything left? Zev? I'm all set, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so we'll need a motion to table this to the next meeting. I got it. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Two Penguin Properties LLC for site plan review of a mixed use building with 1,920 square feet of non medical office space on the first floor and one residential unit on the second and third floors and amendments to the Tarbox Triangle subdivision located at 14 Hill Way be tabled to the regular. September 15, 2020 meeting, period. Second. All right, Maureen, go ahead and take a roll call. Mr. Bedensky? Yes. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Hubner? Yes. Mr. Gilbert? Yes. Ms. Jordan? Yes. Mr. Sarbeck? Yes. Chair Shalat? Yep. Okay, motion passes. Okay, thank you, Rick and Zev. And the final uh, item, Planning Board Digital Remote Operations. Planning Board will review meeting logistics and upcoming items. Maureen. Um, 
I have nothing. Okay. Maureen, do you have any update on the what we're looking at with regards to the short term rentals? Um, we're on. Um, you have the same package you had at the August meeting, so my assumption is you'll continue to review the amendments at the September meeting. Uh, my my sad part is I was hoping that I could um, save more of the September workshop so you would have more time to work on those amendments. But right now we've got at least two projects in the queue. So again, it's it's looking like a crowded workshop evening. That's why Jim's gonna be on a boat. Wonderful. <laughs> Sorry. Jim. Oh, I tell you, I'm gonna tell you, Jim Marwurst has his hand up, but I'm not sure it's it's uh we've already moved on no no look at you signing off and maybe so all right never mind uh looks like it's just us on here oh wait attendees okay um anybody else oh just a uh, a shout out to the town i think that village green thing is looking really good Man, it's looking good. Yeah, just terrific. Yeah, it is. I like it. Especially the flagpole. The flagpole's <laughs> awesome. Flag flagpole. Except there's no flag on it. What's up with that? They're they're in order, I think. They're they're in order, but um, the town doesn't own that property yet, and so we really need to be oh. respectful that it's mm -hmm. private property before we start holding flag raising ceremonies. So, what's the significance of the mast? Is that so you can have more than one flag? Yeah, there will be the United States flag at the top, and then there will be the state of Maine flag and the town of Cape Elizabeth flag on the mass. Oh, wow, I bet you see a, a Marine Corps flag on there too. Something. That's right. Should be. <laughs> Definitely should be. We have a town flag on, on the I know. We do, and it's on order. <laughs> now, let me ask you, did you get the uh, the this bicentennial flag for me to put up there? No, I did not. Ah, see? Maureen, is there gonna be a light that's gonna be on that uh, flagpole or is I it believe that the town did arrange for additional electricity to be brought there so that we could have a light on it, yes. Hmm. Otherwise, that's gonna be, someone's gonna have to take that up and put it down. So. Oh yeah, I know that Jim, there's Jim been a lot that. of coordination back and forth between uh, the the developer and the town for some adjustments to the village green so it's as you can see the the, the veterans monument has already been moved there uh, it's pretty exciting Jonathan I think you'd be part of the color guard you can take it down every night you know yeah, there you go Cape Elizabeth uh, the police have a great color guard yeah they do um, one question I the uh, Oh, is there any timetable on when the town will take ownership of that? I'm hoping when it, it's not so hot and dry. According to Skip Murray, he has to be able to mow it at least twice before he can transfer ownership or something like that or sign off on it. I well, there's, there's still some missing items. There's still some, you know, some sidewalk that needs to be finished up and some lighting that has to be installed. So um, he's, he's on it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Maureen. Mr. Bedensky. Oh, yes. And thank you for finishing early. I had to get out of here by nine. Appreciate okay. it. Actually, you have to stay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <Mr>. Curry. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Hubner. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Sarbeck. Yes. Mr. Shalott. Yes. Chair Shalott. Sorry. <laughs> Does he make Sorry. you call you? I'm easy. Call you that? Right. No, I actually try to mirror the 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 method used by the town uh, clerk, who is really ah. precise in how she handles things, and so she's my my model. Mm -hmm. yeah. John Joe, you know. <laughs> dear leader we call him dear leader <laughs> all right well it's unanimous and the meeting is adjourned <laughs> bye guys have a good night hasta la vista good night <laughs>